I'll just ask the first question. Anybody decide, you know, anybody has anything to say, take it up, to, uh, you know, sort of pipe up. But, um, well, I guess two questions. But the first is, do you think with the uh, crushing of the territorial area of the ISIS, so-called caliphate, and now with al-Baghdadi uh, whimpering and crying before he blew himself up, does that make it, is it more likely that we're going to see potential terrorist attempts, penetration attempts from ISIS on our border or our airports or anywhere else? Um, do you think that, I mean, does that factor in at all? Does it, you think it makes any difference in the likelihood of people trying to get in? Anybody? Yeah, Robin. I, I, I think that, that looking at the numbers, the taking away the territory from ISIS has reduced the threat overall. Um, it's taken away, obviously, uh, a lot of their funding that they can no longer extort people under their control. Um, they, uh, their propaganda networks have gone down or been reduced. A lot of their high-value people have been killed, uh, specifically people who are targeting Europe. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty unambiguous about the fact that taking away the territory is going to reduce the threat overall, and I think the numbers bear that out so far. Good, good. Um, I can take, I've got more questions unless somebody has a question. Uh, yeah, wait for the mic. So this is a question for um, either Robin or Todd could probably answer. Um, so, and Robin, you mentioned this in your comments about how Europe has had to respond to, uh, you know, migration flows. Um, but you mentioned that they're largely, you know, kind of stuck because the EU obviously can only do so much. They can, you know, they can give money to Erdogan. Um, they can kind of do these Dublin agreements that everyone hates, especially, you know, Italy and Greece. Um, what do you think the EU can do moving forward as one body to, you know, stymie flows um, instead of just relying on individual states? <coughs> the key part of that, the key part of that question is, is, is that as one body, mm -hmm. this is the thing that paralyzes the European Union all the time because you haven't half got some different opinions within that block about how to deal with this and very radically different governments, very radically different approaches to migration and with the way some of the voting patterns are going. I mean, you know, who knows who will be in charge of some of these countries in the year to come. There has been some, there's been, there's a recognition of the fact that, that this is an issue, which means there's more money, more funding, more focus being placed on it. They have seen some kind of temporary um, borders being put back up actually within certain countries that are especially impacted by it. I, I think that the, the, issue, the philosophical issue, though, I think is irresolvable. Th European people feel very, very differently on this. From, like, look at the East Europe v. West Europe approaches to migration. Th this is not resolvable. So I, I think you can, do, you can do stuff at the edges, and they have done stuff with funding, the deal with Erdogan and various other things, but the philosophical part of it, I think, is, is unfixable. Um, I had actually a, another question myself, and that is some of this is speculation. Um, obviously, it's all speculation, really. But we faced actually something very similar to what Europe saw in the sense that Obama didn't actually say anybody can come in and uh, they'll be able to stay. But our policy kind of was like that, and that's what we saw starting in a small way in 2012, really picked up in 2014. We've taken hundreds of thousands of people who were led into the country. They overwhelmed the system in a similar way as happened to Europe. Um, and we have a decaffeinated, low-calorie version of that problem because most of them were from Central America, which, while they're might well be problematic people. They're not likely to be Islamist terrorists. But my question is, what do we do about the people who may well have used that flow to already get into the country? That's kind of my point. Because even if there were no you know, Islamist terrorists among the Hondurans uh, making bogus asylum claims, those large groups of people crossing all at once left the rest of the border in that sector open. And who knows what came across there. My point is, what can we do N now that we're sort of turning that flow down a little bit, but it went on for several years? What do we do about cleaning up what may have happened already? Well, I can, I can address that at, uh, up 
uh, through example, an emblematic example, which is that one of the post 9-11 policies that we implemented uh, in a homeland security context was, remember that when people come to the border and they hit the border, especially special interest aliens, they are unknown to us. They usually don't even have identification with them. They just say, my name is Ahmed and I'm from Ethiopia or Somalia. And so uh, one of the um, ways that we uh, decided to counter that problem was through direct eye-to-eye -eye threat assessment interviews. And for a time, the FBI was doing it, then ICE intelligence, that when they got into our detention centers, we would take, take the time to uh, spend as much time as possible going through pocket trash and interviewing them and uh, getting a sense of whether or not they were being deceptive, which of course would make them ineligible for asylum. Almost all of them make uh, asylum claims. And that one-on-one -on -one, uh, interaction was highly valuable, not just um, at the border, but in Mexico and in route, some of the countries in route. And I think what happens is that when our border systems are crashed, uh, like they were, that doesn't happen as much. Everybody's busy. And I think that there is a gap through which uh, it would be very easy for somebody who was hiding their identity and motives and true selves to kind of come right on in and bond out uh, without the, uh, e even in normal non-crisis periods, uh, it's my understanding that those direct uh, assessments, uh, interview assessments were not happening uh, anywhere near 100% like mm -hmm. they were supposed to. A very key uh, counterterrorism uh, program with that. Jim, yeah. yeah, and you know, one of my big concerns in with the advent of the cartel wars with the election of President Calderon 2006, the Mexicans had a lot on their plates. I mean, there was really a drug war going on in the country. And that certainly took their resources, changed the landscape for them. And could they help the gringos with their counterterrorism programs, certainly not as much as they did between 02 and 06, because their intelligence services, their police, their courts, their prosecutors were really focused on the drug war. So we lost that. And that sort of dovetails into what you're talking about when you've got literally caravans of hundreds of thousands standing at the border. Um, does that open the opportunity for, for more sophisticated bad guys and folks that could be linked to terrorism? In my view, absolutely. Uh, hello, this is a question for Todd. Um, so you said there were 104 terrorists who had crossed um, borders into Europe, but between those years, 2014 to 2018, there were millions of asylum, um, asylum refugees who were coming. I know Robin said there were one to two million in Germany alone. Um, and so that ratio is pretty small when it comes to refugees who were actually terrorists and refugees who had legitimate claims. Um, and I know several years ago it was a talking point that you were more likely to be killed in a car accident or injured by a car than you were to be a victim of a terrorist attack. So why is that ratio concerning um, at least in regards to the U.S. or even in Europe. So it, it is true that if you were to do the math on this, that you would put a decimal point and then a zero, zero, zero with maybe some numbers uh, trailing off into infinity, that the, the number 104 terrorists, if you were to compare it against the total number of you know, millions that, that have come in, is very small, minuscule. Uh, but I would argue that uh, that what Europe shows us more than anything that is that um, small numbers have extremely high consequences, mm -hmm. and you could also argue that you know 19 you know hijackers in the United States sent us off to war for 20 years plus a bunch of other terrible things. Um, but in Europe, I'll just say that um, the, the the consequences went far beyond body count. We had about 170 dead and maybe uh, 900 or so wounded in various attacks that are still going on. Um, but as my uh, our colleague Robin pointed out, uh, those terror attacks, even more so than the um, immigration from foreign, really alien countries, 
uh, drove electoral outcomes throughout the continent. We saw it in the last uh, couple of years, and when you study the polling uh, that, that was uh, being taken consistently during the uh, period of these attacks, you can see that the primary interest in Europe, and especially in these countries, was these terror attacks, stop these terror attacks at all costs, whatever it takes, and a linkage of the terrorism to the immigration far more so than like some kind of xenophobia or nativist, you know, right-wing uh, feeling was that average Europeans uh, were, were animated by, by these attacks in a way that affected electoral outcomes in a major, major way all through the country. Mm -hmm. That is, for, for 104 people, a significant outcome by itself, but there was more uh, the EU spent just billions, they're still spending, we don't have an accounting, but I mean, hundreds of billions of dollars, uh, uh, new expenditures in security uh, measures and policies to stop this terror uh, wave, and also to stop the immigration that was bring, perceived as bringing the terrorists in. Uh, you had a very costly three month long military campaign, US led, it's very rarely connected to this issue, but it most certainly is connected. We, um, as, in as Syria, a, you mean? In Syria, uh, to close the Mombij Gap. Uh, the Mombij Gap was seen as the uh, spot where ISIS was deploying its uh, terrorist operatives into the migrant flows. Uh, that was viewed by uh, DOD and American policymakers as unacceptable. And we started a, a, a bloody uh, campaign to close that gap. Uh, we had the, the Schengen Zone Treaty, which was designed to have um, enable internal uh, flow of goods and people uh, within Europe, is over. The 1995, since 1995, um, that, that treaty had, um, uh, up until the 2015-2016 Paris attacks, had allowed all that free movement, but most of those countries have now instituted, reinstituted internal border controls, no more Schengen zone, and they've been re, uh, renewing those. And when you read the documents that support the decisions, they're public documents, uh, that support the decisions of shutting down the Schengen zone, it's terrorism and national security. So that's a significant <clears throat> continent-wide consequence of 104 people. Yeah. Um, it goes beyond that. My colleague mentioned Brexit. Uh, Brexit started as a result of uh, the, the uh, Paris and Brussels terror attacks. Um, there were other factors, sure, uh, for, for, for the uh, Brexit, but, but certainly it started because of those terror attacks. So we could say that, you know, one or two or, you know, 3,000 or 4,000 special interest migrants might have a needle in there in that haystack, but boy, when one or two or three come over, you can expect significant consequences. And I would argue that, you know, as a country, we should put that on the table and respond with policies that take into account the consequences, not the number. Rob? Yeah, yeah just a very, very quick um, addition to that is that, and this isn't just to do with. Um, the asylum question, but just terrorism in Europe generally, you just feel it. It feels different. You see armed police more than you ever used to. All the, the, um, the barricades that have been put up around tourist sites, you see it all the time. I just, was, I've just got back from London uh, last night where you see around Westminster Bridge all the, all the barricades that used to be up that weren't previously because there'd been a vehicular attack there. Um, there was a, and the, the thing I always think of, the incident or non-incident, December 2017, which was when I guess Europe was sort of at its most alert after the series of attacks that had taken place, including four in Europe, four in, 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 London, in the UK that year. Um, you started getting reports through on social media that loads of people had been killed in Oxford Street, one of the busiest shopping roads in London, um, they'd been at some celebrity, I forget who it was, some pop star tweeted saying, I've heard gunfire, taken cover. He fled, massive panic everywhere on the, on the, on the streets of London. Um, and nothing had happened. 
two people had got into a fist fight on a platform at a tube station. This massive rumour had circulated and there was, it was chaos and it was over nothing. It's because people were on edge and people were frightened. And so that, this isn't a specifically migrant asylum thing, it's just to do with the, the feeling in Europe, which is different than it used to be. In, in yeah, can... and I, you know, I, it's difficult to quantify it. And, you know, obviously, first and foremost, we look at the lives of human beings and those who are wounded or those who are killed. But, you know, to me, national security is all-encompassing. It means your economic health and so forth. And when you think of the cost of terrorism, on societies, on the transportation sector, on the tourism sector. You know, as I, I alluded to earlier, my sales pitch with the Mexicans when I first met the intelligence service and sat down in a secret room with them, I said, listen guys, your number two industry behind Pemex is tourism. Europeans and Americans and people from all over the world come to your beaches and come to your resorts. And guess what? After 9-11, they were empty. They were empty. People were frightened. That is part and parcel of what you have to, and it's difficult to quantify those things, but that's what you have to look at, is the impact on the economic health of a country, the attitude, fear. I mean, how do you quantify fear when people take their children to the Louvre and they've got to go through a magnetometer and people are patting them down? Does that impact societies? Absolutely. So. Um, I actually had a sort of broader question that, re that relates to immigration policy in general. And there's sort of always been a sense that, well, we can always let in the good illegal aliens and keep out the bad illegal aliens. But of course, how the heck do we know who's who? And so, and even as far as regular immigration, you know, uh, I mean, often what you end up with is large immigrant communities serving, as Mao would have said, as the sea within which the fish swim. Um, and so my question is, can you really have large-scale continuing immigration, especially from countries where special interest aliens come from, and not end up with serious uh, terrorism problem inside your country? Any, uh, Who yeah. wants to go first? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'll, I mean, I'll just, I'll just throw this out there that really what you're talking about um, may not even um, accrue to a violent jihadi threat. MS-13 trying to determine, sure. you know, who, who, who the gang members are, who, um, you know, who the rapists are, who the convicted felons are in their own countries. The more volume you have, the more difficult that vetting process is to, uh, to implement in And what general. you described as far as the one-on-one, -on -one, you know, because obviously you can't call up the Mogadishu DMV and run somebody's driver's license. So if you're talking about, you know, going through the pocket trash, which sort of is a, it's kind of an interesting concept that there'd be anything in somebody's pocket, but oh, I there's guess great it's possible. Yeah. In there. But also my point is that's really labor intensive. Oh yeah. And if you're going to do it right, can you really, you can't scale that up. I mean, at some point you run out of people to be FBI agents. I mean, uh, you know, there's only 300 million people. You know what I mean? So um, anyway, that's kind of, that was kind of my point. Can you really do um, the kind of oversight and investigation you need? And even things like surveillance within countries once people have already gotten there, if the level of, the size of the problem is so big. I mean, I remember reading that the French police ran out of personnel to follow all the people they needed to follow. Um, so anyway, I mean, that's, that was kind of my point, Robin. Uh, I think, and so the, and the French military have not been able to deploy places overseas because they've had to bring back soldiers to try and keep order better in their own country. I guess a follow-up <laughs> difficult question is, what would society look like if we did have the suitable resources, right? I mean, this is one of the things that Europeans were really worrying about, and especially a country like Germany, where there's very recent memories of the Stasi. If they were to deploy the kind of resources they would need to properly keep track of the threat in terms of, I mean, 30 officers for one terror suspect is the, is the basic ratio that's, that's wow. told to me from Europe. If you are to scale that up, I mean, the UK has 23,000 people on the radar. What does, do you want, is it still a free society if your intelligence agencies are so far-reaching? Um, Could you even hire that many? Right. Uh, secure Probably not. people. Probably not. Right. 
Yeah. But I think also it's it's worth noting, Mark, that Europe's primary response to this, to the terror outbreak of terror attacks, uh, was not just to improve vetting, but to just stop the mass migration right, right, at any yeah. cost. So that's kind of my point. Right, is to that, reduce yeah. the numbers, and right. uh, they, they came up with some creative ways to do it. They're, you know, um, creating uh, offshore asylum processing centers in places like Rwanda and Niger, and they're sending people there. They, the, the Italians cut a deal with the Libyan militias to go to the border and physically stop the migrant flows through uh, through that territory. And aren't all of those kind of things that Europe is doing, see your point was what can we learn from that? I mean, we are in fact doing some similar things. Yeah, bilateral with, diplomacy. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Latin bilateral America America diplomacy. And the Caribbean yeah. and what have you. Did you ever comment? Yeah, you know, 18 years since 9-11, we've gotten better at this game. I remember when I got there right after 9-11, it was starting from ground zero, some of the things I alluded to, looking were. at anecdotal evidence and, and talking to people in the intel community. But we've gotten better. Biometrics have gotten better. Databases have gotten more sophisticated. There's much greater sharing, which the 9-11 Commission pounded on the table about that. Let's stop this stove piping. And in and, and fairness, there were, you know, in the aftermath of the church hearings, there were a lot of limitations on what the intelligence community and what law enforcement could share. But through the Patriot Act and other things, those laws have, have changed, and it's made America safer. I mean, I know the FBI um, has statistically said we've stopped upwards of 100 acts of terrorism in the United States through neutralization and arrest. It's happened. We've gotten better at this game, but the landscape's gotten more sophisticated with cyberspace and ISIS and so forth and so on, but we have gotten better at it, yeah. Well, thank you. Um, we'll, uh, to respect everybody's time, we'll finish it up here. I appreciate everybody coming. This uh, will be on our website. Um, in fact, I think it already probably is. Uh, the paper that Todd published today is on our website, cis.org. And um, Robbins at the Heritage Foundation, heritage.org, I assume his work is there. I'm not sure Jim is on the internet, but, um, but that's okay. Well, great. Anyway, yeah. So uh, I appreciate everybody coming and hope to see you at our next event. Thank you.